mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to be going through just uh, three or four verses of the book of Titus today, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. If you have your Bibles, you want to have them open to these passages as we think and meditate on what they have to say to us. But before we do that, I want you to think and meditate on this beauty. Um, this is my first car. Uh, trusty steed and luxu luxurious, um, known as the Ford Festiva, 1989, uh, had 62 horsepower, um, four-cylinder engine, topped out at about 45 miles per hour, and practically made gas coming in at a whopping 42 miles per gallon. Pretty good life for me. Um, it was my first car and was a <laughs> was pretty was pretty great. I was the talk of the town in my what what was just slightly bigger than a clown car. Um, this car was awesome, uh, as all cars are for a 16-year-old when you first get your your first car. It is the, it's the greatest thing in the world. It gives you all sorts of freedom. It gives you all sorts of possibilities and independence as you, uh, as you drive it around, except for if it doesn't have one thing. What's that? Gasoline. Some of you guys got it. If a car doesn't have gas, it goes from the most luxurious top-end car on the market to a big metal hunk of junk that is be where it's better to have a bike than it is to have a car. Uh, and I found myself in many situations where my car was out of gas and I had to hoof it on foot. Um, <laughs> The reason that I bring that up today uh, is because we're talking about grace. And grace is the fuel of the Christian life, okay? Um, it's the fuel of the Christian life. It's what motivates and guides and propels our lives. It's what gives us energy and strength and steadfastness to follow in the, uh, the commands and uh, and and walk in the ways uh, uh, that the Lord calls us to is his grace. It is the, it's the foundational piece of our Christian faith. So God's grace is the fuel for the good life that, uh, that God calls us to. And as we've been reading through the book of Titus, you've noticed that there have been a lot of commands. God lays out this picture in his word of what the good life looks like in the church, um, uh, this, this intergenerational community where people are learning and growing and trusting uh, and following the Lord together and encouraging one another on in that good work. Um, but that work is useless without the grace of God, because that is ultimately what is the fuel and motivation for our Christian faith and life, okay? It's also, I think, uh, grace is what sets uh, Christianity apart from really every other world religion uh, in the world is grace, okay? Um, every other world religion that you can find or system of religious belief really hinges on um, the right practice of the faith for our, uh, for, or for the, one's salvation or for one's assurance or approval by God. So you can go straight through the list, whether it's Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Each one of them is structured around tenets and laws and commands that if not fulfilled, you do not stand rightly before God but instead uh, stand outside of his approval and with his rejection. Christianity is the uh, exact flip opposite. Because of the unmerited grace and favor that God has shown us in Christ Jesus, where he says, I look at you and you are my child whom I love, who I gave my life for. Uh, when I look at you, I see a spotless, blameless child, okay? Um, because of that 
unmerited favor and approval by God. That is what motivates us to follow and live out the commands of Christ. See, do you see how it's, it's kind of flip opposite from every other uh, world religion around us? Uh, let me just give you kind of a brief Sunday school definition of grace. Um, this is, I remember hearing this when I was in, you know, second or third grade in my Sunday school class, and it's always stuck with me just as kind of a basic working definition of how you define grace. You've likely heard it before. If you haven't, it's a really kind of neat, good acronym, I think. So grace um, is, could be kind of defined or described like this. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, okay? God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, Luther called it the great exchange, uh, where God, in Christ, gives us all things in exchange for our empty-handedness. He exchanges uh, our sin, our brokenness, our fallenness, our selfishness uh, with his unfailing grace. Jesus came into the world and emptied himself so that we might have everything. He came into the world and laid down his life so that we may take up and live ours. I mean, you can see that great exchange all throughout Scripture. He came and made himself poor so that we might become rich. Okay, that's God's grace. And he didn't do it for any other reason than that God is a God of love who looks down at a helpless creation and says, you need saving. And I'm the kind of God who would lay down his life to do that. Okay? That's God's grace. And it is what motivates the Apostle Paul as he writes uh, the, the book of Titus and instructs the church in how to live in God's unfailing and unmerited grace. That's what he kind of foundationalizes them on. And so as we go kind of right into the heart of Titus, in Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14, you have some of the most beautiful passages about grace for our lives as the fuel for obedience, okay? So just, I'll just read it once for you. Um, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. The gra for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we await the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify him, uh, for himself a people that are his very own possession, eager to do what is good. Lots of grace in that passage as you read it. But kind of two different kinds of grace as we, uh, as we think about it. And I'll just say, in this chapter, uh, these are the kind of two types of grace, or the two things that grace does, or uh, two things we learn about grace in the book of Titus. We learn that God's grace does two things. First, that God's grace saves us. And second, that God's grace change it, or trains us. Um, there, you could say it a different way. You could say, uh, you could talk about God's saving grace and God's sanctifying grace. Those are the two kind of modes of grace that are talked about in Titus chapter 2, and they're very fundamental for us to understand. Because I think as Christians, when we think about God's grace, we can make two major errors, and it's getting one or two, or both of these wrong, okay? So first, if you don't understand that God saves you, that it is his unmerited, unfavored love and grace uh, that he looks down on us and saves us without merit or any worth in ourselves, then you kind of misunderstand the heart of the gospel. So just listen to these words uh, that we have about God's saving grace. Titus chapter 2, 11 says this, for God's, the grace of God has appeared uh, and that offers salvation to all people, okay? That's grace. And many of you in your own lifetime can think about the first time where you encountered that grace, uh, where amidst kind of maybe all of your strivings or maybe in moments of great sin and great failure, you came before the Lord and said, how could you love me? 
How could you care about me? How could you, uh, you know, I've, I've done wrong. I don't deserve to be your child. And you heard those words of grace uh, first spoken in the word of God and then to your heart specifically. That God looks down on all people and says, for those who believe and trust in me, I save them. If you get that wrong, uh, this kind of unmerited favor of God, that we're saved by grace alone, then you're immediately off the rails uh, with Christianity, and you're right back in the neighborhood of you know, Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and all the other world religions. If you lose this heart and soul of Christianity, that God saves us by his grace, then you've completely misunderstood the gospel. Because the gospel isn't, God loves you if, it's God loves you because of Christ. Okay? That's his word. That's the heart and soul and message of the gospel, uh, is that God's grace comes to us and saves us. It appears, appears to us. So he says that also, he kind of he um, bookends both of these verses, uh, verses 11 and 14, with the unmerited grace of God. So just listen to how, this is a beautiful passage of scripture. Uh, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I really like a couple of lines and a couple of those words that really jump out and strike at me. The first is this line that Jesus Christ gave himself, right? That is, that is the message of all of Scripture, that we have a God who gives and no more is that shown than in Jesus Christ who gave himself that we may receive all the riches of God. But I also like this one line where it says that we may be a people that are his very own, right? Um, that implies that because of the grace of God, he has called us and made us one with him. That's part of, of the grace of God. It's not just that like God saved you and uh, so go, about, go on living your life, but that God saved you and now dwells in you and lives in you and walks with you and ma has made you one with him and the Father. That is a part and parcel piece of what it means to be saved by grace. Not just that your record's wiped clean, but you're welcomed into a family and a home and a life and an eternal future. God's unmerited grace for us. If we lose that, then we are automatically on the shifting sand that, God, uh, that Jesus warned us about. So God's grace could be seen as saving grace. And that's kind of a heart, the heart and soul of what God's grace is. But that's not where God's grace stops. Okay? So if you just look at um, what he says yeah, next, he talks about God's sanctifying grace. That this grace doesn't wipe the slate clean. Uh, and give us a fresh start and God's approval, but also trains us and changes who we are. So Paul says this, it, this grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope of Christ Jesus' return. Okay, just note, that God's grace, it's God's grace that guides our lives in sanctification or holy living. I think that um, <clears throat> Christians sometimes in the West, and I see, I see us growing more this direction, can be uh, so solid on the first one that God saves us by un his unmerited grace for us. But we miss this one that God's grace sanctifies and guides our lives, okay? That God saves us from our sin, but also doesn't leave us there and guides us in true holiness as we walk and learn and live with him. If you have one and not the other, it just becomes cheap grace, folks. If you believe God saves me, but ultimately that means nothing for my life, okay? Or God saves me, but that doesn't call me to anything new. That doesn't, that doesn't call me to any new living hope or life or activity, then we're mistaking the heart and fundamental aspect of God's grace. Okay? And I think this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to convince the Cretans of in Titus, is that God's grace is not something to just be re received, but not lived in. It's something that changes us, that guides us, that walks with us, that convicts us, 
that forgives us and renews us and picks us up and leads us on our way. Think about like a, a you know, any, any of you who are parents, uh, who have been fathers, mothers, or if you've had a mom and dad, you know that a good mom and dad don't just provide a home for a child, okay? Uh, if you as a parent, uh, you know, you, you have a child and you say, okay, my job is to just make sure that they have a place to sleep at night and food on the table. I'm just looking to keep the kid alive, right? That's, that's, not, that's not a full picture of parenting, right? That's grace. It's good that you've given this child who can't like afford or do anything for themselves a home to live in and a place to be welcomed in and given things uh, and cared for uh, to, to sustain life. That's great. But ultimately, it's not the full picture, right? Because each, par- each and every parent knows that part of your job is to also teach that child how to live and grow and have a good life in God's word, right? It's the same way with Christianity. God's unmerited favor has welcomed us into his household, but he has also welcomed us into this place that we might learn how to live and walk with him, okay? So you can't leave one and take the other, okay? Uh, And if you just take this one, God's sanctifying grace, you're very easily going to fall into this kind of works righteousness notion where you're thinking, okay, unless I'm constantly showing progress, unless I'm constantly seeing progress in my neighbor, maybe the grace of God is not in them, right? If you, if you throw all your chips on God's sanctifying grace, it, you can go right off the rails just as much. And you can start to say, well, I'm not, you know, this person, they, they sometimes don't talk like a Christian. They sometimes don't, don't act like a Christian, so they must not be a Christian, right? Eh. I wouldn't say that. Okay? I wouldn't go there, necessarily. If they trust in the Lord Jesus, then they have God's unmerited grace and favor. But it also calls us to walk in that grace, too, and to understand both parts of it. So I think that this is important and foundational for, for our church and for every church throughout the, throughout the ages, that we understand God's grace as his grace of salvation and his grace of sanctification. One final thing um, I, I, I like about this, um, this passage is how the word uh, appear comes up, okay? And how great God's grace appears. So uh, in, again, the two kind of verses 11 and 14 say this, for the grace of God has appeared. It's come to life. It's, uh, it's come on the scene in our world. But we also wait for the blessed hope the appearing, again, of our Lord, uh, of, of, uh, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You and I sort of live between the two appearings of Christ, the appearing of his grace in, in Christ Jesus in history and the time which he will return to make all things new. Let me just tell you, between those two appearings, life isn't always easy. It's not always easy to walk in God's grace. It's not always easy to see God's grace. It's not always easy to trust in God's grace. It's not always easy to be guided by God's grace. But we live in a day where we know of God's grace and glory through Jesus Christ, and we also await the day where he redeems all things finally, frees the world from sin, wipes every tear from every eye. And I think that that is important for me as a Christian because it's it's, it's a pilgrimage. It's a walk. It's a struggle sometimes for us as believers. But what gets us through, what guides us, is the grace of God that has appeared and the grace of God that will appear again and redeem all things, okay? So as we live as a church, may we live in the unmerited grace and favor of God's saving grace and also in his guiding and sanctifying grace that he shows us too. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, may your grace be the fuel for our lives, um, uh, our inspiration as we uh, seek to live out your word, and also um, our hope uh, for the world to come too as we await to see your gracious reappearing again. In your name we pray, amen.